stage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Do you all hear me well? Yeah. Even in the back? OK, good. Yeah, so let's start. Let's talk some deep learning. Last hour before lunch. My name is Nora, just as you said. I'm a self-taught data scientist at a company called Shang Zuckerberg Biohub in San Francisco. So I flew in two days ago, and I love Toronto so far. And I'm originally from Sweden, but I live in San Francisco now, and I never want to go back. I have to, because we don't have a work visa, but I don't want to. I want to stay. <laughs> like, for good. And if there's anything I want you to remember about me, is that I love to put place deep learning or put this deep learning on everything. And one thing, it's pretty dark, but this is a model that both understands images and the Swedish language. So I give it an image of a, a sofa or couch, and I ask it to give me like a pitchy, pitchy sentence about this couch. And it, this is in Swedish, so you have to just trust me on what it says. So it looks at different <laughs> parts. All these white spots are where it's the field of view of the model. So it looks at the couch, like investigates it, and then it says like this, literally. Nice couch in genuine leather. So, but yeah, it's pretty, yeah, it's a pitchy way to describe a sofa. I'm also doing more serious stuff. I'm helping and build a software as a service for researchers to identify human bone cancer cells. So, except for couches and furniture, I'm also doing like, some serious stuff like this. So, it helps them to find human bone cancer cells within their samples and they just upload their image and they get all the information they need from the cancer. Okay, so this talk, let's see if I move this. The outline, three steps. I'm gonna talk a bit about topic, the idea, move on to data, and the last part, which is the most exciting one. It's training the model and see the performance and see how it performs. Okay, starting with idea. When you think about AI or deep learning, you might think about complex solution or complex apps or inventions like self-driving cars or intelligent assistants like Alexa or Google Home or what I do, I look at cancer cells. But what I want to tell you today is it doesn't have to be that complex. It could be something that you're passionate about or an idea or I mean um, like an interest or passion or a day-to-day -day problem, something you encounter like every day or just a trend, like a mega trend, like globalization or transportation or like climate change, something that you're interested in. So what did I do? I like looking like this. So I spend some time in the morning putting on some makeup, a lot of makeup, and I guess a lot of other people do the same. Because of that, I also look at inspirational videos at YouTube. The only problem is that if you search for makeup tutorial on YouTube, you get over 30 million videos explaining you how to put on your makeup, so makeup tutorials. And further, the um, beauty industry is a $400 billion market, so that gives you an indication that it's a significant part, it's a significant part of people's lives putting on makeup. So I thought, um, I might not be the only one putting on makeup, I'm not the only one looking for videos since there's 30 million out there. How do you bridge the gap? How do you find a video that tells you, that helps you find a makeup tutorial that suits your facial features or your particular face? Could you use deep learning for it? So that's the first part. So for the idea, I just want to stress again, it doesn't have to be a complex solution. It could be something as easy as makeup. Data, one of the most important parts of training uh, a powerful and robust neural networks. Now look, let's look at the data. Deep learning and convolutional neural networks are exceeding when uh, into classification from taking high dimensional data as videos, images, audio, and classify it into discrete categories. But what kind of data do I need to understand what kind of makeup videos, videos that would suit my facial features? So I started to study the face, and there's a lot of features in the face. I mean, there's a nose, there's jeans, there's eyes, and there's a mouth, but mostly the eyes. There's a lot of videos spending time on like, the eye section. So that's where I started. And I narrowed down the problem even more. Like, could I f create a model that actually understands and recognizes people's like, eyes, the shape, or like, different traits of eyes? So the further what I'm going to try to uh, train is a classification model that is exposed to images and divides them into different categories. 
I investigated eyes even further, and there's four distinct shapes out there. There's round eyes, monolith eyes, hooded eyes, and almond shaped eyes. And there's a lot of varieties to that, if they're like deep set or wide set or whatever, but these four are the four most distinct ones. And so you need a data set. And I used a data set, uh, an open data set with hundreds of thousands of images of celebrities. And I manually cropped out the eye section part <laughs> <laughs> and divided them into four different categories. And this is alma, uh, alma eyes, hooded eyes, monolith eyes, round eyes. Just a summary of the data I used. So four different categories, 200 images for each category. So I looked at 1,000 images in total crop them out, and then 100 more for the validation. So for a training data set, 800 in total, and 400 in total for the validation. So it's a fairly small data set, but what I want to stress is the, the folder structure. I'm telling you this because I have a repo where you can just add your data and get a model out of it. But I do really want to stress this because you can use existing data and tailor it into something that suits your particular problem. So even though you have a small data set, you can still get a pretty robust model out of it. That's the data. Uh, let's talk about the most exciting part, it's training the model. And um, before that, just by show of hands, uh, how many here have worked with convolutional neural networks before? Yeah, pretty much. And also, how many of you know how a convolution operation is performed? Okay, yeah, so yeah, nice. Essentially, there's two ways to train a model. Either you train it all the way from scratch and you initialize it with randomly um, initialized weights, or you use transfer learning where you use pre-trained weights that have been trained on a larger or more diverse data set, basically. And that's what I did with my model. I had a pretty small data set. So I used pre-trained weights that have been trained on ImageNet, which is 1.2 million images divided in 1,000 different categories. And I'm using the the more the deeper layers that already learned something about shapes and forms and contrast to populate and use transfer the learning from the pre-trained weights into my, my new model. And when it comes to choosing an architecture, there's a bunch of different networks to choose between, ranging from networks with fewer operations to other networks with a lot of operations. This is just a small subset of available networks out there, but the one I chose is called VGG16. Why did I choose this one? It's because it's fairly simple. It's fairly simple building blocks. It's straightforward. You pr it's easy to understand the architecture, and it's easy to start with if you have a pretty small data set, as I did. So I used. And this is how the network looks like. Five convolutional um, pooling blocks, ending up with a fully connected layer, which is the one that actually performs the classification where the classification happens. Horizontally, it looks like this, where you can clearly see it goes from a high dimensional input image, and then gradually the dimension is reduced all the way into a small vector, which is the one that's going to help the model to classify which kind of image it looks like, looks at. So you see the input image and the feature maps gradually reduced into a very small, low dimensional vector then. So, and every, just briefly look at the box, just briefly understand what the, what the network sees when there's an image coming of an eye section. So it's two convolution operations followed by a pooling operation. Starting with the convolution operation, all the images, even though this eyes, eye images, can be represented as a matrix with its pixel values, like this. This one is very simplified. It's a color image, so the pixel values are between 0 and 255, but this is a simplified example. So let's pretend that the pixel values are 0 or 1. So for the convolution operation, we're going to use another little matrix, 2 by 2 matrix or 3 by 3 matrix. And we're going to let that one slide over the input image, perform element-wise multiplication between every step of the matrix and the image. And I'm going to put all, or it's automatically the outputs are put together into a new feature map. And this is what the network actually sees. The feature map is traveling down through the network. And the last step of every convolutional block is a pooling step where we look at the most important features and just grabbing those and transforming them into a new, another feature map. 
So that's briefly what's happening here. Okay. And since we're using pre-trained weights, we're using already we're using filters, this little matrix that's been sliding over the image. We're using pre-trained filters already. So instead of having a random little filter traveling across the image, we're using a lot of already specialized filters to know exactly what to look for in each input image. Like this. So it's a subset of the filters used in a VGG pre-trained network. Like this. So we already know exactly what to look for in an image. This one is probably in charge of finding like contrast in an image or like the next one finding like transforming lower let's see dimension to even lower ones. So it travels like that. And this is actually what the network sees. And some of these images are pretty scary, like this one. <laughs> <laughs> but this is how the images travel from a high dimensional image into lower and lower dimensional, ending up with just the most important features that the network picked up and saw in all of these images. And this is the last step before the network actually tells you what ca category the image belongs to. For activation, I used a nonlinear uh, function called ReLU, because so far the, the network has only been using linear operations, and the very last activation was a softmax. Just summarizing the training phase, pre-trained weights from ImageNet, I used the architecture called VGG16, uh, non-linear activations, dropout rate of 0.5, just to make the, the model generalize better. The last fully connected layer were had an activation function called softmax, and then I ran this for 50 epochs, 16 images at a time, until the model had seen all the images in the entire set. And I know this might sound like a pretty complex model or a complex network, but I want to show you how few lines of code that is needed for you to train the exact same model, and this is everything you need. You just initialize the base model, this is built in Keras, a high-level high deep learning library built on TensorFlow, by the way. You add your little special top because it's trained on, a, on ImageNet, which is 1,000 different categories, and I only have four of them. We're building your own little top for the network to know that you just need four categories. Initialize the model itself. You're locking all the layers that you want to use with the pre-trained weights. Train it, compile it, train it, and then you just save your model. So it's there's, a little, there's so few lines of code needed for you to train your own model like this. Okay, so back to the problem. What can our carrier see? Do you think that my network performed that? Roughly between 0 and 100%. 80? Anything? 90. 90? Anyone else? 30. <laughs> That's a good guess, though. <laughs> no, it performed better than that. Without any optimization, it performed between 90 and 93%. So it's fairly good, actually, understanding what kind of eye shape it coming at it. So in this case, it was the almond eyes. So just to recap, started with the idea phase. It doesn't have to be complex. It can be something that you're passionate about or something that you're interested in move on to the data. You can build yourself a data set that's tailored for your problem out of uh, existing data sets. It's really possible. And last part was training. The most exciting part, of course, seeing what the network is going to give you. And since I got over 90%, I decided I want to do a product out of this idea. So I built a front end, super simple front end, using Bootstrap and Angular, Angular a back end which basically is the model receiving the image and then sending it back to the front end. And it looks like this when you're just printing out the model in the back end. It's all of this condensed into just a few lines of code. And the last part is a flask app that just orchestrates this image coming from the front end, sends to the back end, and then back and forth. And this is just flask part, just taking the image, classifying it, and then send it back. And just briefly, and I'll show you a demo of this application as well. They're taking a photo, uploading it to the back end, predicting what it is, and send it back your eye shape. And 
I have a repo ready for you to try where I built a front end in, in React instead of using Bootstrap and Angular. So it's a React front end where you can just clone the repo, add your own images, it tells you everything about how you want the file structure, and then you can train the model and then apply the model to the back end and just see wha what, your s what score you're getting it. I'm going to show you another link to it in a few seconds. So in conclusion, I love AI. <laughs> and I love deep learning even more. I try to apply it on every all problems, like big and small. But what I really want to encourage you to do is to try to take your idea into a product and building something end to end. I think it's a very important part of actually learning to create something from end to end. That's what I want to encourage you to do. And one last thing. Can I have a demo? This will be pretty difficult. I'll try. Wow, okay. <laughs> I have to look both ways. Like that, I guess. Yeah, got my eyes there. Anything I got? Round eyes? And this is the makeup that will suit my face. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, we have some time for questions. If you have any questions, uh, put your hand up, and I'm going to bring the microphone to you. Um, we're going to take about five minutes. Okay. Um, I'm going to be unfair and ask two. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're quick, though. Go um, ahead. Uh, and I'll just say them both at once. Um, why did you choose to flatten at the end rather than something like global max pooling? Um, and the second question was, um, does the uh, does the app give you a, a degree of certainty about its prediction of your eyes, or does it just give you an answer? And, and what happens if it doesn't know? Does it spit out something with a really bad score, or does it say, maybe you should take your picture again? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good questions. The first one, why did I flatten it? This is the very first, the very first application I built. And back then, I built early 2017, and Flatten were just the first thing I encountered. So that's <laughs> the easier question to that. But no, the new the segmented when I'm segmenting the the cancer cells, I'm using I'm not flattening them out. It depending really on the network. But this was the very first one, so I tried it out. And what happens if the model is unsure if of the eye shape? In this case, it will give you an answer. Mostly, it will just go for almond-shaped eyes because it's the most common shape. So like 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 it, it will probably say it's almond. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, so you bust me there. It's not yet done yet. <laughs> but in the future, it's supposed to say, "Oh, I'm a bit uncertain. Maybe you should like retake it, or the the probability is that you have this shape, or can you take it better, like lighting conditions or anything." And also, I should train it for a fifth class, like others. Like, this is probably not a picture of an eye. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the nice talk. So uh, my question is that you, you've used transfer learning um, of based on the image net. So my question is, what impact do, uh, if you've used it, for example, another database in order to, ha to do transfer learning, what do What's the impact of that on the accuracy of your model? This is the first question. My second question is, have you used another model rather than the VGG, for example, from the, the literature? I know there are m many models which are known. Have you tried another one? And um, why have you used VGG uh, instead of another one? Thank kay. you. Thank you. So the first one was, Sorry, what was the first question? <laughs> I think we so gotta go the, the one impact time. of the impact. If you change uh, ImageNet by another database in order to right. train the weights of your model to do I transfer see. learning, do this impact the accuracy of your model? This is the first question. Okay, the first one I remember now. Okay, 
it will probably impact the, the currency depending on how big that data size that data set is i guess imagenet is one of the largest ones with over 1 million images um, but if you use a fairly small one yes it will totally impact it i try to train this only using my data set and it scores like 50 percent 50 percent accuracy so you can use like a s much smaller one obviously and i also used i like fine-tuned it a bit as well so yeah i really think the size of the data set will like impact the, the currency and the second question other <laughs> other architectures yes in the same repo i have another repo that's also public i made the same thing a front end and a back end where you can use any of the i mean not any but at least 10 different architectures restnet deepnet like darknet squeeze net mobile net so i'm training with different ones but for this particular app i use bgg because it's fairly simple and it's easy to just lock the layers that you want to use and build your own little top on top of it but i have other repos if you want to train on other networks already up there and do bgg have the best accuracy then uh, is the, uh, compared to other models do bgg have the best accuracy or is it just mm. the simplest one? That's an interesting question. I haven't tried this particular data set with another network, so I haven't done that. But I'll, I'd love to try that. That's a good idea. <laughs> thanks for suggesting that, though. <laughs> hey, th uh, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask, so you sh in your example, you said you got an accuracy above 90. But if um, I had a pet project amount and I was starting at a much lower percentage, how do I start changing either the architecture or fine tuning the weights so that I can go up? Okay, I think I need to mo no know a bit more, but generally, I is it a computer vision problem? Okay, this one is very naively built. There is no learning rate optimization. I haven't optimized it in any way, basically. I just augmented the images a, a couple of times, like like switching them and c making them bigger or smaller. So I would probably look at the learning rate. That's something I'm using all the time, either if I do a segmentation problem or in this case, just a classification problem. So I'll definitely look at the learning rate and see if you can map it out and see how it behaves. That's the very first thing I will try out. But I think I need to more. I need to know a bit more <laughs> to answer that more specifically. But come and talk to me afterwards. I'm gonna be here. I know it's lunch, but still, I'm gonna be here. <laughs> when you started to manually crop all those images, uh, did you have to like normalize the size of all the input images? Because I bet they're in different resolutions and like thighs would be small. Like, I did. That did. Matter? Yeah. yeah, I pre-processed the the data set, so I resized all of the images before I cropped them out. Um, but when you're training the images with the VGG or other ResNet or whatever, you have to specify a size of the image that you're training. So, but I did pre-process them and I sh made them all the same size before I fed them to the network. I Thank think you. we have time for about two more questions. Okay, just someone is on. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, once you know the shape and the form factor of the of the eyes. Uh, you are uh, you are predicting essentially a sort of uh, makeup that suits that eye form factor. So my question is, how do you know this information? Is this already a prior that you know or and that you are using to predict, or is that also uh, gathered from an AI tool? You mean what kind of makeup that works for different eye shapes? Was yes, exactly. That's something I had to learn. I just, I, I studied like what kind of makeup that suits. I mean, it depends on what kind of look, essentially what kind of look you're going for. And depending on your, your eye shape, you can just enhance or like improve the symmetrical. So in a way, typically we would think an AI or a machine learning tool learns everything. And after that you have no supervision, but here you have a certain rule-based supervision oh, yeah. at the end of the product. So the ML tool is basically segmenting for you. Is that is that how you want it to develop in the future or you would like to actually learn through celebrity images or people who do great <coughs> makeup to learn the actual makeup aspect of it? That's an interesting question. Like long term, yes, I like to have a more sophisticated algorithm and not just like a rough classification model. So yes, unsupervised learning like further on when you have a 
bigger data set. And when you know more about the user, that will be totally super interesting. But yeah, right now it's just like a classification model pretty, yeah, it's definitely supervised and it's like forced into these four classes. But moving forward, I'd love to like, incorporate more of a like, sophisticated learning phase. Thank you, I hope that I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, thank you again, Nora. Thank you, appreciate it.